suns and planets in Neolithic rock art. If you have had your attention directed to the novelties of thought in your own lifetime, you will have observed that almost all really new ideas have a certain aspect of foolishness when they are first presented, a whitehead. In science, unlike religion, great revelations lie in the future. Coming generations are the authorities, and the pupil is greater than the master if he has the gift to see things anew. All fruitful ideas have been conceived in the minds of nonconformists, for whom the known is still the unknown, and who often went back to begin where others passed by, sure their way. The truth of today was the hearsay of yesterday. Manuel Velikovsky, brilliant. In Worlds in Collision, Emanuel Velikovsky claimed that the planets only recently settled upon their present orbits. That, in fact, great cataclysms have distinguished the recent history of the solar system. All agree that if true, this thesis would have profound implications for various branches of natural science, particularly celestial mechanics and cosmology. Few agree, however, as to what constitutes valid evidence of the sort of events Velikovsky describes. Velikovsky himself, together with many of his supporters, suggested that advanced claims regarding the state of the various planets, such as the inordinate heat of Venus, or radio noises emitting from Jupiter, both anticipated by Velikovsky prior to their discovery, constituted prima facie evidence in support of the thesis. His critics, however, because the truth always has critics, countered that correct predictions do not always constitute verification. Just take a look at that look that Shapley has on his face. Does he look at all like a happy camper to you? To me, it looks like someone peed in his Cheerios. I wonder how many people he shut down, or how many fingers he stepped on, just because he could. It's like putting perfume on a pig of the underlying theses. While some even question the specificity and or verification of Velikovsky's advanced claim. One, thus question remains. What sort of evidence apart from Venus suddenly leaving its current orbit and resuming a comet-like appearance would it take to convince conventional scholars that the planet recently moved upon a different orbit that the ancient skies were vastly different than the ones we see today. Now, we are so lucky. It is apparently not enough that ancient peoples from around the world said as much. For example, a survey of ancient traditions reveals the following recurring motives. 1. In ancient times, different suns dominated visible heavens. 2. The world was once plunged into darkness and brought to the brink of destruction when the sun was eclipsed as a result of being swallowed by a giant dragon. Three, on one, wouldn't that just kind of make you want to scratch your head and investigate it? But it sounds crazy, yeah, but if they're saying that, I mean, they're not just smoking dope and writing anything. On one occasion, it is said the planet Venus took on a comet-like appearance. Two, such traditions in the rare event that they are encountered and subjected to analysis are notoriously difficult to interpret and in any case are typically explained away as poetic metaphor having little basis in reality i mean seriously I, mean, I think they have little basis in reality but they seem to like being bored indifference to the currently prevailing opinion which would downplay the importance of ancient mythological traditions we seek a more objective source of evidence with which to explore the nature of the ancient cosmos, in addition to the ancient literary traditions. Another record exists which offers evidence in support of recent changes in the solar system, namely prehistoric rock art. I love that stuff. Ancient sky watchers from around the world have been drawing pictures of the celestial bodies since time immemorial. The fact is that such pictures cannot be made to accord with the current arrangement of the solar system, prehistoric petroglyphs of the sun. The discovery in 1879 of spectacular paintings in the caves of 
Altamira, Spain, was initially met with disbelief and ridicule. So radical was the idea that Stone Age men could have created art of such sophistication and beauty, and it is sophisticated and beautiful. It was only upon the discovery of similar finds in France, Portugal, and elsewhere in Europe that the scientific world became forced to accept the reality of Paleolithic rock art. Indeed. It has since been shown that rock art is abundant upon all inhabited continents and spans a period of time measured in millennia. The paintings of Valtimira and Lasso are typically dated to circa 10 to 20,000 BC. 3. During the Paleolithic Age, rock art was primarily devoted to the realistic representation of various forms of wildlife, the latter presumably objects of the hunt and rites of sympathetic magic. Especially common are paint. Now, that's people that are already messing around with magic, and they make these brilliant paintings. They had bigger brains than we did. They're referring to cro magna man. Especially common are paintings of horses and wisent and great bison that once roamed the steppes of Europe. Although mammoths, woolly rhinoceroses, and other long extinct fauna also appear. It was during the Neolithic age, apparently, that man began recording his perceptions of celestial phenomena through paintings and petroglyphs, incised images in rock, not unlike fossilized bones which provide an objective record against which to check the deductions drawn by paleontologists. Rock art represents objective record of mankind's enduring interest in the stars and offers a check upon conclusions deduced from comparative mythology, period. Among the most common petroglyphs are those typically interpreted as images of the sun. Included here are some sample images featuring a circular disk from which rays emanate in all directions. Certainly, this is how one might expect our forebears to have depicted the current solar orb. Other images, however, are more difficult to interpret. Consider this figure, figure 2. One of the most common images in all of ancient rock art depicts what would appear to be a circular disk with a smaller orb set within its center. Even more difficult to reconcile with the current appearance of the sun is this figure, figure 3 which depicts a flower-like object set against the backdrop of an orb or disk. Although less common than figure 2, this image also has parallels throughout the ancient world. Consider further the image represented in this figure, figure 4. How is it possible to explain the wheel-like spokes, typically 4 or 8 in number, of this supposed solar petroglyph by reference to the current sun? And yet this very image occurs throughout the ancient world. Most perplexing, perhaps, is the fact that such images occur in Neolithic contexts and thus predate by several millennia the invention of spoked wheels. Figure 5 finally adds a pillar-like appendage to the aforementioned images. Here again we are dealing with a petroglyph of universal distribution, typically interpreted as the sun with rays. Uh, it looks kind of funny, but you know, it, it looks like the pillar, of course. Although the various sun images occur in wide variety of artistic contexts, you can kind of, it is not uncommon to find them associated with scenes of apparent worship and ritual. Well known, for example, are engravings depicting people offering salutations to the sun god with upraised arms. In Kamanika Valley, arguably the richest and most thoroughly excavated petroglyph site in the world, Anadi observes the carvings of the first period are limited to the depiction of one person praying facing the sun, which is drawn as a disc with a dot in its center. Such scenes, coupled with the obvious prominence of the sun, in ancient religion have led scholars to assume that the solar images served some sort of religious purpose for the Stone Age artists and their community. And Johnson. Although the various sun images occur in a wide variety of, of artistic contexts, it is not uncommon to find them associated with scenes of apparent worship and ritual. The anomalies presented by these images have not escaped the attention of scholars. Aside from the fact that each of them is routinely identified and fingerprinted with the sun, the various sun images would appear to have very little in common 
apart from the presence of a smaller orb in the center of a larger disk. In the sun gods of ancient Europe, M. Green offered the following observation. It is very difficult to interpret the exact meaning of these sunlight images occurring on passage gravestones. If we may assume that the signs are symbolic, then either they are purely abstract or they represent something in the natural world. They just Wilcox asked, not without some justification, why the ancients would see so many symbols, so many different symbols for the sun. Wilcox asks, not without some justification, why the ancients would need so many different symbols for the sun. Noting that the forms claim to be solar symbols do not really look like the sun. Wilcox would regard them as non-representational in nature and suggests their origin is rooted in physiology. Of course he does. There would thus appear to be two schools of thought with regard to these so-called solar images. That which would regard them as rooted in the natural world and thus representational and that which would regard them as non-representational in so much as anything that has to do with electricity no I'm just kidding i made that up and so much as each of these petroglyphs might be paralleled on any of the inhabited continents it is difficult to accept proposition that they are purely abstract in nature no doubt i mean they didn't just make that stuff up yeah i, I got a buzz I, I think i'll paint a face today or i'll paint a Something that looks like a planet. It is difficult to accept the proposition that they are purely abstract in nature. Whatever they represent, it seems clear that the images had as their inspiration some objective reference in the natural world. How then do scholars explain the peculiar nature of the sun images? I always like that word, pe 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 peculiar. It's like when you call a crazy person eccentric. Uh, peculiar is another one of those words. Here Green speculates that for some reason ancient man was unable or disinclined to depict the sun as it actually appears. When we look at the way that mankind in ancient Europe depicted the image of the sun, we see immediately that its obvious circularity dominated his perception. But what is more interesting is that man did not simply look at the sun and copy what he saw to the best of his ability. He went further and interpreted the superimposed new images of the sun, which were not based entirely on his visual perception. Why this should be the case is not intuitively obvious. There's a good phrase, intuitively obvious. That's a good one. That's a keeper. That's like s s s sat in sarcastic triumph. You know, I like that too. Filikovsky would describe the professors that were watching him with their arms folded as sitting there in sarcastic triumph. All right, I gotta write that down just a second, yeah. One might think that part of communicating the sanctity of a religious symbol would be recording it faithfully, particularly if the symbol served a magical or epitropaic purpose, as in fact is known to be the case with sun ages, which are featured prominently on amulets throughout the ancient world. Moreover, it is common to find solar petroglyphs upon the same rock face with images of animals and people, the latter drawn in relatively realistic fashion. Why then need we invoke subjective factors to explain the solar petroglyphs? There is a very simple answer to this question. It is simply unthinkable to consider the logical alternative that the petroglyphs faithfully depict the ancient sun, albeit one radically different in appearance from the current solar orb. This is not to deny the possibility that sacred images become more abstract through time. Certainly representations of the ancient sun god became more anthropomorphic that's the second time I've come across that word in the last two days. As civilization progressed, the question before us is not whether religious images are subject to evolution and transmutation. Rather, why prehistoric images of the sun do not conform with its current appearance? If one is willing to entertain the possibility that prehistoric rock art is representative in nature, how is it possible to discover the celestial phenomenon behind the various sun images? In so much as writing did not yet exist at the time most of these images were created. It would appear that we have reached a dead end in our investigation. Religious beliefs, however, are notoriously conservative in nature. Indeed they are. And thus it may be possible to trace our solar forms 
Should this prove to be the case, we might gain therefrom some insight into the original significance of the prehistoric images. With this strategy in mind, we turn to consider the iconographical evidence from the ancient Near East, where we will find that strikingly similar images appear amongst the earliest art in writing. <laughs> Pictographs of the Sun in the Ancient Near East It is well known that writing originated in the Ancient Near East, first in Sumer and shortly thereafter in Egypt. The earliest scripts, great reliance was placed upon pictographs in order to convey the message of the writer. Initially, the various pictographs represented familiar objects as realistically as possible and thus, in most cases, it is possible to identify the natural objects depicted in the various pictographs. Upon further evolution of the script, however, the signs took on an increasingly abstract character, particularly in Mesopotamia and the Egyptian script generally retaining its pictographic form. The Assyrian character glyph, for example, is known to have evolved from a Sumerian pictograph featuring a bird. Recognizable amongst the earliest pictographs of the Sumerians, Egyptians, Maya, and Chinese is the solar disk with central dot, our figure two, in both Egypt and China. This sign originally connoted sun. Other pictographs feature a rosette, a wheel-like disk, the sun disk upon a pillar and thus resemble closely our figures 3 through 5. Such correspondence support the conclusion that a certain continuity exists between prehistoric images of rock art and pictographic systems of writing, a conclusion reached by scholars on other grounds. There would also appear to be a general continuity with respect to the objects of worship. Thus, it is well known that the sun god featured prominently in the earliest pantheons of both Sumer and Egypt. If we are looking for clues to the nature of prehistoric sun god, it is essential that we inquire into the sacred I I I I iconography associated with these cults. Of the Sumerian god Utu, Utu, relatively little is known. Indeed, read, 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 read even the reading of the god's name is not beyond doubt. Among the symbols of God, however, appears our figure too, the sun disk with central dot set upon a pole. Better attested is the Akkadian Shamash, who appears in a wide variety of iconographical contexts upon countless cylinder seals and reliefs. For example, Shamash is depicted in anthropomorphic form emerging from the mountain of the east. The most common symbol for Shamash is shown in figure 6, attested already in Akkadian times. And we talked about that with Ted last Saturday. In most cases, the image features a circular disk in the center, of which appears a four-pointed star, with wavy lines emanating between the points. This particular symbol may appear alone, or more commonly alongside a crescent and a star. A patent reference to the intimate relationship believed to exist between Shamash, Sin, and Ishtar, the divine triad of ancient Babylon. Although the crescent of Sin is readily understandable, given the god's customary identification with the moon. Why the ancient Babylonians would have represented the sun with this particular symbol is difficult to explain. The same image, moreover, is frequently found perched atop a pillar-like structure, raising further questions as to the objective basis of the image. Remembering the pillar-like appendage associated with early sun images. In prehistoric rock art, one can't help but wonder whether the Babylonian symbol of Shamash atop his pillar-like staff represents a stylized vestige of the former. Elsewhere, however, Shamash could be represented by another symbol which features an eight-pointed star set against a circular disk. Here, too, it must be admitted, it is difficult to see the resemblance between this image and the current solar orb. Why the ancient Babylonians would elect to represent their sun god, Shamash, with an eight-pointed star is a, is a question which bears careful consideration. Indeed, 
A satisfactory answer could portend a revolution in our understanding of the recent history of the solar system. Stars and Planets in Early Pictographs The eight-pointed star is one of the oldest pictographs in all of ancient Mesopotamia. Occurring already during the prehistoric period, according to leading scholars, the star sign originally signified the concepts God, Heaven, or On, a clear indication, it would appear, of the celestial basis of Sumerian religion. In later times, scholars are agreed the star came to be regarded as the special symbol of the planet Venus. This planet featured prominently in Sumerian religion, being identified with the goddess Anana, her Akkadian counterpart being Ishtar. Indeed, according to Wolfgang Heimpel, the identification of Inanna and Venus was first made in prehistoric times and is apparent in all historical periods. In addition to the eight-pointed star, the planet goddess Inanna could also be signified by several other pictographs. Prominent among these is the rosette, see figure 9, in which like the star, commonly adorns artistic scenes and objects deemed sacred to the great goddess. About the antiquity of the rosette's association with the goddess, there is no doubt. Thus, Van Buren declares, from the earliest times the rosette was a symbol of the goddess Inan Ishtar. Ishtar. Significantly, early examples of the rosette closely resemble the star featuring little more than eight appendages or arms extending out from a central dot. Indeed, as Van Buren points out, it is probable that the rosette is artistically cognate, cognate. with the eight-sided eight-pointed star. The eight-pointed star of Ishtar, frequently illustrated on monuments of the second and first millennia, was an adapted form of the archaic rosette, as may be clearly seen from the star carved at the top of Kaduru from Susa. The group from S.U.S.A. Kaduru from Susa. Our discussion of the star of Ishtar has direct relevance to the question posed earlier. What is the significance of the eight-pointed star adorning the disk of Shamash? Given the intimate association of the star, with the planet Venus. The question arises as to what relation, if any, exists between the eight-pointed star and the Shamash symbol and that which signifies Venus. Does this convergence of imagery mean that artistic license prevailed? Or does it perhaps commemorate some hitherto unrecognized relationship between Venus and the ancient sun god? The sun and Venus in ancient Egypt that the worship of the sun in various celestial bodies belongs to the oldest Egyptian religion is commonly acknowledged. Countless passages in the pyramid text, for example, allude to the king's identification of the ancient sun god and his intimate relationship to the morning star. In Egypt, the star appears amongst the earliest pictographs being found already upon pre-dynastic pottery, although both eight-pointed and five-pointed stars are attested very early on. The five-pointed star eventually came to predominate. Here it is relevant to note that the image of a star superimposed upon a disk also appears in Egyptian hieroglyphic writing as an ideogram for the underworld. Diagram 11. This sign may be transcribed as either Det or Duat and is conventionally translated the kingdom of the stars, or the star circle. It is acknowledged, however, that both words are cognate with the name of the morning star, Duai. Indeed, according to T. Hoffner, the word Duat originally signified the morning star before later being used in a sense of starry sky or underworld. Thus, it is reasonable to conclude that the Egyptian sign of the star in disk, like the Babylonian analog cited above, likewise had some reference to the planet Venus, figure 11. In Babylonian iconography, however, the star of Inanna, Venus, was superimposed upon the disk of Shamash, apart from the obvious resemblance of the disk of the Duat to the disk which elsewhere forms the backdrop of the sign of Ra, of Re. Now I just get confused with the R-E. Is that Re or Ra? Uh, were there two of them? Or did they just spell them different? 
I'll have to find that out. Is there any evidence linking the sign of the Duat to the ancient sun god? The truth is that the evidence leaves no doubt upon the matter. Thus, in the pyramid text, the Duat is specifically identified as the domain of Re. Ra or Re. Let's see what he says. Re. Re. Hmm. Thereby attesting to the region's intimate relationship with the ancient sun god. Elsewhere, the Duat is identified as the place from which the sun rose in the morning. The identification of the Duat as the netherworld on the one hand and as the place where the sun rises on the other strikes the modern reader as incongruous. Nevertheless, the idea of the sun god as the regent of the netherworld was common throughout the ancient world. Here, a most relevant parallel is to be found in Sumerian tradition, where the netherworld was known as Dilman. Dilman, described as Kiyufori, the place where the sun rises. This epithet of Dilman significantly finds a close parallel in the cult of Inanna. Thus, in an early hymn known as Inanna's Descent to the Underworld, the goddess identifies herself as Kiditu'ez, Inanna of the place where the sun rises. Such tradition suggests that the relationship between Venus and the netherworld, and between Venus and the ancient sun god, was of a more intimate nature than hitherto suspected. It might be objected here that the Egyptian sign of the Duat features a five-pointed star while the Babylonian symbol of Venus features an eight-pointed star. While it is beyond the scope of the present article to investigate the significance of the various star forms associated with Venus, suffice it to say here that Inanna Ishtar could also be signified by a five-pointed star. Indeed, the five-pointed star as a symbol of Venus is well attested throughout the ancient world upon Babylonian Kuduru. <coughs> Moreover, the Venetian pentagram can be found superimposed upon the disk of Shamash, figure 12. The Sun and Venus in Mesoamerica. Worship of the ancient sun god in the planet Venus is as conspicuous in the New World as it is in the Old. Each of the so-called solar images can be found in prehistoric petroglyphs, as can the eight-pointed star and pentagram. In most cases, of course, New World petroglyphs occur in contexts otherwise devoid of writing, and thus it is difficult to be certain which celestial body is the subject of the glyph. Such is not the case in Mesoamerica, however, which reached a high stage of civilization under the Olmec and Maya. In addition to developing a sophisticated system of writing, the Maya were also skilled astronomers capable of calculating the period of Venus to within a fraction of its true value. Early symbols and petrographs of Mesoamerica consequently provide an invaluable key to unlocking the secrets of celestial imagery in prehistoric rock art. A prominent characteristic of Mesoamerican astronomy indeed of Mesoamerican culture in general, was an obsession with the planet Venus. Like their counterparts in ancient Babylon, Mesoamerican sky watchers chronicled the movements of Venus with amazing diligence and accuracy, viewing it as an agent of great omen and danger. Of the Mexican preoccupation with Venus, a Spanish monk was led to report so accurately did they keep the record of the days when it appeared and disappeared that they never made a mistake. It would be difficult to cite an aspect of Mesoamerican culture devoid of the planet's influence. Temples were constructed and aligned with the purpose of gaining the optimum view of the planet. Various rituals including human sacrifices and the practices of war were timed to correspond to important aspects of the planet's orbit. Even the calendar was designed to take into account the planet's movements. Anywhere the sacred iconography associated with Venus abounds. 
The omnipresent influence of Venus upon Mesoamerican culture invites comparison with Old World cultures, particularly that of Babylon, and as we have documented elsewhere, the two cultures share much in common with respect to the sacred traditions and iconography surrounding the planet Venus. Among the Maya and Aztecs, for example, Venus was represented as a star. This was in keeping with its name, Great Star, a common epithet of the planet amongst the various peoples in Mesoamerica. Figure 13a depicts an Aztec symbol for Venus. This figure bears comparison with the four-pointed star which adorns the disk of Shamash. In figure 6, the resemblance is striking, down to and including the central point within the fourfold star. It is even possible that the volutes which distinguish the Aztec glyph correspond with the wavy lines which emanate from behind the star in the Babylonian symbol. The resemblance between the Aztec symbol and the Mesopotamian, needless to say, supports the conclusion that the four-pointed star originated in the objective appearance of the planet Venus. The same basic image is apparent in figure 13b, a version of the Lamet glyph, an acknowledged Maya glyph for Venus. Here the star is set against a circular disk, not unlike that associated with Shamash, as figure 13b and figure 13c and then there was figure 6. It is equally common, however, to find Venus depicted as a five-pointed star. See figure 13c. Here, too, the Mesoamerican symbol finds a close counterpart in the Babylonian cult of Ishtar, Venus. Figure 12. Figure 12, right there. Quincunx. The Quincunx. As was the case, in the ancient Near East, pictographs featured prominently in Mesoamerican systems of writing included among the earliest petroglyphs is one believed to be associated with the planet Venus. See figure 14. Commonly known as quincunx from the appearance of four circles about a central orb, it has been said the quincunx is the most frequently occurring sign in the Mesoamerican symbolic language. And like the star in Mesoamerican and Mesopotamian iconography, the quincunx appears ubiquitously amongst the sacred icon iconography surrounding the planet Venus. Given the Maya's renowned obsession with heavenly phenomena, it is not surprising that other celestial objects also came to be represented on their sacred stele and imposing stone monuments. The sun, for example, was commonly signified by a glyph known as the kin. See figure 15. Of the kin glyph, Thompson opined that it was probably derived from some type of four-petaled flower. It is not uncommon, however, to find the quincunx sign superimposed upon the kin sign. See figure 16. Of the meaning of this surprising superimposition of glyphs, Thompson offers nary a clue, only the following observation. The quincunx is frequently set on the regular four-petaled kin glyph, apparently without altering its, uh, its value in any way. The reader will recognize at once, of course, that this is the very same situation we encountered in ancient symbols from the Old World. Again we ask, what could possibly be the significance of this bizarre convergence of iconography, whereby a sign of Venus is placed upon the sign of the Sun? Archaeal astronomers, confronted with this evidence from ancient hieroglyphs, might well be tempted to suggest that early scribes were trying to illustrate some important celestial event, such as the inferior conjunction of Venus and the Sun. 
The latter is an event recurring every 584 days or so in which Venus passes directly between the Earth and the Sun. Unfortunate for the hypothetical thesis, however, is the fact that Venus is invisible during inferior conjunction, and thus this would appear to be a most unlikely explanation of, of the glyphs in question. Another possibility, of course, is to assume that modern scholars have erred in their identification of the glyphs for the Sun and Venus. This, too, is highly unlikely, at least with regard to the sign for Venus. What, then, can be the explanation for the glyphs in question? The position taken in this essay accepts the ancient signs at face value, as fateful, albeit some somewhat rudimentary attempts to depict a celestial phenomenon in which Venus appeared to be superimposed against the backdrop of a much larger sun-like orb. Those readers familiar with previous essays of Talbot and myself will recognize here a familiar theme. Summary In the present essay, we have documented that glaring anomalies distinguish the earliest iconography associated with the various celestial bodies. Prehistoric petroglyphs from around the world consistently portray the ancient sun god in a fashion that bears little resemblance to the appearance of the current solar orb. Among the most common petroglyphs are those which show the solar disk equipped with a central dot an eight-spoked body, a rosette, and a pillar-like appendage. The fact that the very same images appear amongst the earliest pictographs in Samaria, Egypt, and Mesoamerica not only confirms the stubborn longevity of these sacred images, it offers some justification for the view that continually of beliefs, justification for the view that a continuity of beliefs e.g. astral worship, likewise underlies the common images, thereby offering hope of discovering the original significance of the prehistoric petroglyphs upon analysis of their historical counterparts. In Mesopotamia, as we have seen, the most ancient symbol of Shamash, depicted as a star upon a circular disk, the star, however, originally signified the planet Venus, not only in Mesopotamia, but also in Mesoamerica and Egypt. In light of the fact that the Babylonians and Maya are renowned for their astronomical prowess, particularly as it applied to the observation of Venus, we would venture forth the opinion that the stellar iconography surrounding this planet was representative in nature and thus reflected the objective appearance of Venus in prehistoric times. How then are we to explain the presence of the Venus star upon the disk of the Sun? At the very least, this juxtaposition of images suggests a hitherto unnoticed relationship between the planet Venus and the Sun, difficult to explain given the current relationship which pertains between these two bodies. More probably, these images allude to a lost solar system, one in which the planet Venus appeared to be superimposed upon a sun-like orb, the latter to be distinguished from the current solar orb. Support for this conclusion can be obtained upon further analysis of the prehistoric sun images. Certainly, there is a remarkable resemblance between the Venusian star in figure 8a and the eight-spoked body adorning the sun disk. In figure 4, indeed, it is the opinion of this author that the eight-spoked body in figure 4 does in fact represent the planet Venus, and thus marks a prehistoric analog of the eight-pointed star in which adorns the symbol of Shamash in figure 7. Nor is it difficult to recognize a certain affinity between the rosette in figure 9 and the flower-like object adorning the solar disk in figure 3. That the rosette 
was one of the oldest symbols of Inanna Venus, is commonly acknowledged as its intimate relationship to the eight-pointed star. As we have seen, the eight-pointed star is frequently depicted as little more than eight arms or spokes emanating from a central hub, figure 10. And some early examples of the star, such as that from Elam depicted in figure 8b, render the resemblance to the Venusian rosette readily apparent. Indeed, the resemblance extends to the finest details of the respective images. Witness the dark dot located within the innermost core of the star, found not only in figures 3 and 8b, but also within various examples of figure 2 and 13. Having discussed the images represented by figures 3 and 4, it remains to discuss figure 2, the most common petroglyph of the sun, and one of the most prominent images in all of ancient art. Figure 5 will be dealt with at length in a subsequent essay. If we are to be consistent, the smaller orb is to be identified with the planet Venus, that the same body may at one time be represented as a star and elsewhere as an eye-like orb upon the face of the sun god need not be a contradiction. In ancient times, perhaps, the planet went through cyclical phases, not unlike our current moon, which alternately presents the appearance of a crescent and a circular disk. More probably, the different images associated with the planet Venus represent different stages in the evolutionary history of the planet particularly as it related to the planet's interaction with the ancient sun god and other bodies in the solar system. It can be shown, in fact, that the planet Venus underwent various metamorphoses, metamorphoses in appearance during its long-term association with the ancient sun god. During the course of the past decade, Talbot and myself have discussed several of the more clearly delineated phases in the history of Venus. Among the most prominent, as we have documented in great detail, is the phase in which Venus was identified with the eye of the sun god. Thus, it is that Venus is identified with an eye, or with the eye of the ancient sun god. Throughout the ancient world, in ancient Egypt, to take the most familiar example of this motive, the eye of Ra, one of the most sacred objects in all of Egyptian religion, is identified with Venus and the glyph for Ra, it may be remembered, is our figure two. Conclusion Together with the polychrome paintings of bison and mammoths on the cave walls at Altamira, ancient images of the sun and planets, Venus provide compelling evidence of lost worlds. The hypothesis that Venus moved upon a radically different orbit in very recent times during the Neolithic age, perhaps, will no doubt be met with the same skepticism as which greeted the discovery of the Paleolithic cave paintings in the past century. Be that as it may, the testimony of ancient rock art is not to be explained away. Indeed, it is our opinion that the evolutionary history of the solar system can be reconstructed in great detail upon analysis of ancient iconography and mythology like the ancient oracle at Delphi. The mysterious images engraved in stone call out to us with news of the ancient gods. But given the cynical nature of the modern world, who among us will listen? Ev Cochran. And then he has his footnotes here. Uh, number one, this was a frequent ploy of Sagan, for example. See Sagan, Carl Sagan, an analysis of worlds in collision. Scientists confront Velikovsky. That's just kind of ridiculous, really. That's just a way for them to make themselves feel better. I will uh, roll the footnotes here for you. And I uh, just remembered something, too. In my talk with Ted, I said that the only one that so far had given dates or some kind of a time chronology was Velikovsky, which was more recent, and... John Cook, but that's not true. How soon I forget. As I think it was last June, I did a three-part series on the Purple Dawn 
with myths or history from the website. And he goes into great detail on the chronology of the Purple Dawn. I will list it at the end of this video for you to check out. I just about completely forgot that I did those videos and had to do a little refresher course. He goes into about the greatest detail of them all, and that is the same gentleman that made the three-part series, The Jupiter Myth, which I wholeheartedly recommend to you if you have not seen. It is very good. He doesn't go into so much of a time chronology there, but his website is chocked full of it, and that is uh, mythsarehistory.com. I will leave a link in the description. So sorry about that. I just plum forgot. And I will leave you with a few minutes of Symbols of an Alien Sky. If you haven't seen that, you really should, because you'll be in for a treat. All right, that'll do it for me. Thanks. Take care. I'll see you on down the road. An explosion of human imagination occurred, an outpouring of mythology and symbolism that defined cultures for thousands of years. Long after the celestial provocation itself was forgotten. In these early historical times, there are no records of the present planets, no diaries recording planetary motions or periods. Planets as we know them today did not exist. These were the gods, awe-inspiring, and at times capricious and terrifying. Early star worshippers speak of a great light of heaven, motionless in the sky, the Egyptian Atum or Atum Ra, the Sumerian An, the Babylonian Anu. And enigmatically, early astronomers knew the overarching figure as the planet Saturn, whose story will be a centerpiece of our third episode. In the beginning, the gathered powers were not seen as separate gods, but as the primeval unity of heaven, the perfect conjunction, or great conjunction of the Golden Age. A massive sphere hung in the sky, and in its center stood a radiant star surrounded by explosive streamers. Cultures the world over came to see this star in feminine terms as the mother goddess, the planet Venus. Remembered as the great star, the mother of all stars. This was the central eye, heart, and soul of the primeval sun, his animating life, power, and glory, and much more. King the world. This was the terrible goddess, raging in the sky with wildly disordered hair or multiple flailing arms, a celestial spectacle radiating a paralyzing light. When instability and displacement occurred, the streamers discharging from Venus grew chaotic, giving the planet a frightful countenance. The angry goddess was a comet the mythic prototype of comets. Emmanuel Velikovsky's great comet, the planet Venus.
Seen in front of this central star was a smaller, darker, reddish sphere. This was the mythic warrior, the masculine heart of the heart, the child in the womb, the child on the lap, the pupil of the eye, the axle of the cosmic wheel, the most active figure of world mythology. Sky worshippers everywhere knew the identity of this warrior, the victor over dragons and chaos monsters. This global identity of Mars as the greatest of warriors shouts to us an unrecognized history. On the great sphere of heaven, a bright crescent appeared, with the orb or star of Venus between its horns. Things never seen in our sky were once revered around the world. The configuration evolved through numerous phases, The number of streamers changed repeatedly, as did their observed form. Every change in relative position produced dramatic change. The Australian physicist Wallace Thornhill flew to Portland for a 30-day visit. He convinced me that the forms I'd reconstructed were electrical. They were plasma discharge streamers stretching form will change with the intensity of the discharge. The whirling forms I'd reconstructed in the common symmetry, which I'd often laughed about, did indeed have a physical explanation.